Hey everyone, thanks for joining me. It's good to be with you again. You know, for the last couple of weeks, we have been looking at Jesus and his human roles as prophet, priest, and king. Last week, we considered the Lord Jesus in his role as our great high priest, and we contrasted his priestly ministry with the Levitical priesthood. And the writer of Hebrews makes the point that it is so much greater. And of course, we are only appreciate our need for a high priest to the degree that we realize how holy and unapproachable God is and how sinful and defiled we really are. We have to have a holy mediator between us and a holy God. And that is none other than the Lord Jesus. In fact, this ministry is such an important ministry of his because it identifies and confirms, first of all, that he does have this place as the one and only who can come before a holy God on our behalf. Secondly, it shows the perfection of his one time for all forever sacrifice for our sin. And then thirdly, it also confirms how sinful our condition really is, showing that we require someone who is perfect to be a mediator between us and a holy God. So his priestly ministry involves both the sacrifice of himself for us, as well as his ongoing intercession that's made for us. Now, before we move on to studying about Jesus as our king, today I want to dig a little deeper and look into Jesus as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. We didn't touch on that at all last week. Because a lot of people don't really understand the significance of this truth. He's not a normal topic of discussion among Christians. The only time I ever get to talk about him is if somebody asks me a question or if... Uh, if he happens to be a topic of a Bible study. But it's been a pretty long time since I've taught about him, so it's likely that a lot of us don't know who Melchizedek is. When was the last time you read a sermon or heard a sermon about Melchizedek? Or when was the last time you heard a sermon from the book of Hebrews, much less about Melchizedek? So to begin, let's see who Melchizedek was, because for many of us, he is a mysterious figure. He only appears twice in the Old Testament, briefly in Genesis chapter 14, and then again in Psalm 110. He's only found in one book of the New Testament, and that's the book of Hebrews. He's mentioned five times there, and uh, he is identified as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, this label for the Lord Jesus helps, us to, helps to open our eyes to the greatness and the glory of his priestly ministry even more for us. So, in essence, the more we learn about Melchizedek, the more we're going to learn about the Lord Jesus. Now, there are those who believe that Melchizedek is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. In other words, he's a Christophany. Partly because there's uh, because the writer of Hebrews exhausts the Melchizedekian order, and partly because there is no mention of his ancestry. Most of the time in the Old Testament, the writers will identify people by telling us who their father and their forefathers were. But that's not the case with Melchizedek. He just comes out of nowhere. And so they conclude that he was someone with no beginning, as is the case with the Lord Jesus. But truthfully, that only applies to him as being a type of Christ, not necessarily an Old Testament appearance of Christ. So I don't really believe personally that Melchizedek is a Christophany, because he only served and blessed Abram as a priest. If he was an Old Testament manifestation of Jesus Christ, then Abram no doubt would have worshipped him. But that didn't happen. He was a great man to be honored because of his position and his ministry, but not a man to be worshipped. Now, he wasn't of the Levitical priesthood because he wasn't a descendant of Levi. He actually was born five, six hundred years before Levi. But his priesthood was far superior to the Old Testament priesthood, which is one of the main points of the writer of Hebrews as well. So he's first mentioned in Genesis chapter 14, as I stated, right after Abram defeated Kedar Leomar and his confederation of three other kings and rescued his nephew Lot, whom they had kidnapped. Now, Melchizedek was the king of Salem, who also served as a priest of the Most High God. Abram was in the valley of Shaveh, meeting with the other kings for whom he fought, when Melchizedek shows up. 
And we read in verses 18 through 20, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of God Most High, that is, El Elyon. You may remember some time ago we studied him. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. Now, right away, he's distinct because we see that he's not only a priest, but he's also a king. In fact, his name means king of righteousness. But he was also the king of Salem, so he is the king of peace as well. That word Salem comes from the Hebrew word shalom, which we know means peace. But it's interesting in the scriptures that peace and righteousness are often found together. Isaiah 32, 17 says that the work of righteousness will be peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. And I love Psalm 85, 10. It says, mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Of course, the only true source for genuine peace is in perfect righteousness. And when we are declared righteous through faith in Christ, we have peace with God. Romans 5, 1 says, therefore, having been justified, which means being declared righteous, Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, God's desire for all of his people is that they enjoy the peaceable fruit of righteousness. You read about that in Hebrews chapter 12. But we saw last week that the throne and the altar were separated. A king was not able to serve as a priest because you remember King Saul and King Uzziah both were judged by God for performing priestly duties. So, Melchizedek's position as a king priest is unique. Now, the Levitical priests who were established maybe 600 years later were appointed for the nation of Israel alone. But the priesthood of Melchizedek was more extensive and really unlimited in its, in its scope. It was a priesthood that was, in fact, universal because he is not identified as a priest of Jehovah as the Levitical priests were. Their ministry was limited to Israel. But Melchizedek is a priest of God Most High. He has a universal priesthood. You'll notice, too, that Abram paid a tithe to Melchizedek from the spoils of his little war, long before the tithe was established by the Mosaic Law. But Abraham is acknowledging two things with his tithe. Number one, that his victory was God's victory because it was God Most High who delivered his enemy into his hands. And number two, he was acknowledging the greatness of this king priest. And because Levi and Aaron had not yet been born, they were descendants of Abram. He was, in essence, according to Hebrew tradition, confirmed the greater priesthood of Melchizedek over the priesthood of Levi and Aaron. Now, the other Old Testament reference is Psalm 110, verses 1 through 4. That's a messianic psalm. But let me read this. It says, a psalm of David, the Lord, Jehovah, that is, said to my Lord, the Messiah, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest after the order. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So Jehovah is declaring his priestly order. Now there's a lot that we could focus on, but I just want to highlight the first words of Jehovah to his Messiah. He said, sit at my right hand. Do you have any idea how often that phrase is quoted in the New Testament? I want you to listen to some of the inferences that the New Testament writers make with that statement. Now, these points come from D.A. Carson. But what we see here is Israel's majestic covenant God speaking to the Messiah. First of all, he acknowledges that he is greater than David. Acts chapter 2 and verse 34 and 35 say, For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Secondly, he is acknowledging that he is greater than the angels. Hebrews 1.13, 
But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Now, obviously, that's a rhetorical question, but there is no other mediating person that sits at the right hand of God. Thirdly, he is exalted to God's right hand side. As someone once said, God has exalted him as emphatically as man rejected him. Acts chapter 5 and verses 30 and 31 says that the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior. So it really is the highest possible place of honor given to the Lord Jesus. Fourthly, his position at the right hand of the Father is the location from where he makes intercession for us. Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Number five, his session at the right hand of God signals the completion of his sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 and 12 says, and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Unlike the Old Testament sacrifices, loved ones, the sacrifice of Christ does not have to be repeated. It has been done once, and when he died, he cried out, it is finished. No more sacrifice needs to be made for our sin. Number six, he awaits the ultimate conquest and surrender of his enemies. Hebrews 10, 13 says he sits at the right hand of God for that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. So all of these things are inferred from this one little phrase in Psalm 110 and verse one, sit at my right hand. I'm going to stop there, and we'll dig a little deeper next week by looking at what the New Testament writer of Hebrews said about Jesus and his priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. As you can see, though, there isn't a lot of biblical content on Melchizedek. What we do have as it relates to Christ, however, is pretty substantial. And because Melchizedek is a type of Christ, the more we learn about Melchizedek, the more that we'll learn about Jesus Christ. And loved ones, we desperately need to know more about Jesus Christ, don't we? I hope you agree. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your priestly ministry, uh, for the priestly ministry of your son. We thank you, Father, because his position as our great high priest after the order of Melchizedek, we thank you that that we can have confidence in our salvation, in that sacrifice that was made once for all. And we can have the expectation that one day, all of his enemies will one day be laid at his feet as they are defeated. So Lord, teach us more of the greatness of your son through this priest named Melchizedek. Help us to see and learn more about him so that we can learn more about our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray and ask this together in his name. Amen. Well, be blessed, my friends. Never underestimate the power and the greatness of our Lord Jesus. He is the one and only mediator between us and the Holy God. He ever lives to make intercession for us, and he's praying for us even now, and that's a great encouragement to my heart, and I hope it is to yours as well. But he's also granted us access to the Father. So praise God for our Lord Jesus, our priest after the order of Melchizedek. Well, Lord willing, we'll see you again next week. Goodbye.